All right, well, this morning, I would like to go over to part three of our series on the seven Hebrew words for praise. The seven Hebrew words for praise. And as we're working our way through this, what we're trying to determine, Brittany, is why do we do this thing? You know, why do we even have a corporate Sunday service? Why do we gather together? Uh, for so many people, we think it's for us. We think, you know, uh, bless me, pastor, I dare you kind of thing, you know. Uh, we come in here thinking that God's got to give me something. But really the purpose for the corporate worship service is for us to have the opportunity to present our gifts and our sacrifices to God. That's really the purpose of it. And then the side benefit of that is, he says he inhabits the praises of his people. So the best part of that is God's going to show up when our praises line up. Well, I'll make that a t-shirt. That was pretty good, wasn't it? We, God, God's going to show up when our praises get to the place that we draw him. We get his attention. And, and in that process, God has laid out these seven functions of praise to get us to go there. The first one we talked about was Yadah. With Yadah, we're talking about reaching out and, and putting your dependence upon God as a child reaching for dad. You know, uh, when Abigail walked in, here, well, she was carried in here this morning. Uh, Kim set her down, and the first thing she did was turn around and said, lifted her arm and said, pick me back up. That is a form of yada. God, pick me up. I'm here. This is the process. And once we did Yoda, we did Toda, which the, the Toda deals with declaring a thing, declaring the word of God, putting the word of God into action, praying the word of God. Then we talked about Shabak. Shabak is to shout. To, um, there's nothing about praise when you're doing praise that's quiet. You know, I'm praising in my heart. No, it's got to come out of you. You know, when, 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 a, when the rock star walks through, everybody's, ah, or the football players, and we're at the fan, we're starting to chant, we're starting to yell, we're starting to let people know who we're for. That's part of that process of praise and worship. And then we talked about the Barak, which is to kneel and to humble yourself, to bring yourself to a place of humility that shows you, God, I have a dependence upon you. My mother used to teach that God placed a spout in the back of your neck, and when you're stiff-necked and stubborn, you close it off for the grace of God can't be poured in. But when you humble yourself and you bow, you open and allow the grace of God to be poured in. It's a position that we take. It's an attitude that we take. So many times we come into the presence of God, Laura, and aren't changed because we're stiff-necked. We're stubborn. We're like... My situation's different. My, my thing that I'm going through is different than anything that anybody else is going through. So God, you have to change your approach because I'm different. No, we're stiff-necked. All we really need to do is come before God and humble ourselves, become teachable, become pliable, and he will direct your path. Is that not what the word promises you? The steps of a righteous man or a man or woman that is in right standing with God is ordered. So God's laid these steps out and all we have to do is come into alignment with what he's laid out and now his grace becomes sufficient to take us through, to take us through that process. So when we begin to line ourselves up with worship and with praise, and, and we declare our dependence upon God, it opens up a whole nother level for us. It opens up a whole nother level. But there's one part of God that, uh, that he loves for us to participate in, and that is the zamar, which is to sing our praises, accompanied by an instrument, that's why we do what we do. Did you realize, Steve, that what we do is actually listed in the scriptures? We didn't just say, hey, let's have a band and let's go play a few songs and let's sing. 
we're actually following a process that God has set up for us, which is to sing his praises. We know this through the process of the book of Psalms, or some people would translate it the book of songs. Okay, this process was the psalmists and David. King David didn't write the entire psalm. Some people think he did, but there were many writers of the book of Psalms, and they were known as psalmists. They were, they were uh, people in the scriptures that led worship in the house of God. And these songs were written accompanied by instruments. King David was also an inventor. He would hear a sound, and there wasn't an instrument to produce that sound, so he created the instrument to produce the sound. It's been said that he created over 400 different instruments because there was a sound that was being looked for, you know, and it was that process. And even if we look at the makeup of Lucifer when he was in heaven, his makeup and his making was instruments, pipes, cymbals, reed instruments were in his making, who he was. He was the praise and worship director in heaven. That was his job. Now, it's not a coincidence then, Rob, that he goes after the artistic and the musical people in the world because that's who he is. If you think about so much of what happens in the world and so much of the world is influenced, they're influenced by music. We even talk about the music of a generation. If I would go back and talk to you about people in the 50s, we can hear a sound. We know a song. We know a music that is associated with the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and then it got confused after that. <laughs> we had to start over again because we're out of original. Uh, but anyway, that's a pet peeve. That process of music, because what the enemy wants to do is he wants to rob the sound of worship. He wants to rob the sound of praise. Why? Because that's who he is. That was his job. So he, if he can get you to be quiet, then he's limited the ability or your ability to communicate your worship to God. So when you stand there with your hands in your pockets, not saying anything, not participating in any way, you're actually robbing yourself of a blessing, but really you're robbing God of his worship and of his praise. Hmm. Whew. I want God, I want you in my life. I want to draw near to you. I want to then begin to praise him, begin to worship him, begin to start the process of which means you may have to vocalize some things. You may have to begin to tell God how great he is. You know, that, the last song we sang is one of, one of my favorite, which just begins to say, God, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. In that process, we covered a few things. When I came to bow down, what did I cover? I covered my toda. When I said, God, here I am to worship, what did I cover? I covered the Yoda or the Yada that says, hey, I'm here, God, and I'm going to bow down. And then I'm going to cover the, the declaring or the shouting by saying, you're my God. You see how this song is structured and laid out? is not going through and just saying words. We've got to realize what we're talking about here. We've got to realize that the process of, God, I'm here. I love you. I want you to be part of my life. I'm going to declare your word over my life. And that process of praise begins to start. And then when that begins to start, I now have God's attention and God wants to be drawn to that and wants to come to that. He wants to inhabit or take up a place of 
That's why so many times when we pray, we say, God, pull up a chair and be part of, be the center of our attention. Be pleased with our attitudes, our actions, and our words today. Be in the middle of everything we say, do, and think. Everything that's said, God, you be in the middle of it. Well, how does that happen? It happens by invitation. How does invitation happen? Invitation happens through praise. This is the process of praise. Dr. John on Sunday began to talk to us about four keys to a successful church, four things it takes. And two of the P's that were in it were prayer and praise. Jesus said, my house will be known as a house of prayer. So we need to become very uh, skilled at our ability to pray. But for some reason, we're fearful of prayer. We, we, we're afraid to get in the process and begin to pray. And I don't know if it's we're afraid of our own voice, if we're afraid to hear ourselves, or we're intimidated to go into the presence of God. But do you realize, Dan, God wants to spend time with you. If somebody wants to spend time with you, it's okay to go talk to them. The people that I'm afraid to talk to are people that I don't know if they really want to spend time with me. You know, that person doesn't like me anyway. They're difficult to go talk to. But if I know they love me, if I know they care about me, it's easy for me to go in and sit down and talk to them. Who loves you more than God does? You know, I mean, the, the amount of love that God has for you is boundless. There's no limits to it. So why are we intimidated to go into his presence and talk to him? You are literally the most important thing there is to God is you. And all he wants to do is spend time with you. We've talked about the process of prayer what it takes to pray. But we have a difficult time praying for five minutes. And no, no, we're, I'm not beating you up. Didn't he say the same thing to his disciples? He took three disciples up on the mountain with him and said, can you not pray with me for just one hour? My goodness, if we call a one-hour prayer meeting, everybody goes, ah. It's one of the things that was said Sunday. He says, you know, if we call a fellowship that we're going to feed people, the house is full. If we call for prayer, there's three of us, four of us, and that's all. And see, this process needs to change. The process needs to change that we have a desire to spend this time with God. And we become that house of prayer. When we come together as a house of prayer, then we become a house of praise. God says in his word that he's going to restore, as it were, in the last days, the tabernacle of David. If you study the tabernacle of David, uh, Rob, in the Old Testament, that is the only period of time in the Old Testament where there was not a burnt offering given. There was only a sacrifice of praise. So between the times of when the... When, when, um, David's tabernacle began and Solomon's temple was built. During that period of time, there was praise and worship. At the dedication of Solomon's, there was burnt offerings offered again. But through that process, and God says, I'm going to restore something. He didn't say, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of Moses. He didn't say that, even though we know those things are very important. The process of entering into the Holy of Holies is important. We need to cleanse ourselves. We need to spend that time in prayer. We need to go before the, the table of showbread, which is representative of communion and taking part in the body of Christ. We need those things in our life. And the problem is we don't educate ourselves enough to even know what they are. But he didn't say he was going to restore that. What did he say he was going to restore? I want to restore the sound of worship a new process, a new sound. I want my people to worship me in spirit and in truth. That means no fake. It's the real thing. But it's difficult, Pastor Frank, for us to worship in spirit and truth when we've not spent time in prayer. 
Because if you don't know somebody, then all I'm doing is praising the reputation. I hear you're good. I hear you're wonderful. I hear you, but it's different if I've experienced it. If I've experienced the goodness of God, now it's much easier for me to say, God, you're good. If I've experienced the mercies of God, it's much easier for me to say your mercies endure forever. How do I know? Because I need forever. I've seen your grace in my life. I've seen your blessings in my life because we have a relationship. As we develop that relationship, now we go into the corporate time of the Zamar. The Zamar where we begin to play and sing. What do we sing? We sing of the goodness of our God. And there comes a point in time where we're singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is what the scripture says. Psalms and hymns deal with singing about God, singing to God, and then spiritual songs are new songs that are coming about you singing from your heart. This is a song that you have that you're presenting to God. In today's society, in today's terms, that was a good one. In today's terms, we call that the song of the Lord. Where we go out of singing the songs that are on the screen or the songs that are in the hymnal to where we begin to just singing our personal love song to God. This is when you're truly stepping into the zamar of worship, the zamar of praise. When you're actually expressing your feelings of God in song. And here, God, God made it good for you. He did not say, sing if you can. He said, let everything that hath breath. Is there anybody in here not breathing? Okay, we're good. I did, every once in a while, I have to check. You know, everything that hath breath do what? Praise the Lord. So that exempts everybody on this side. You guys don't have to. Everybody over here. No. Everybody that has breath. So as long as you are breathing, you have a responsibility to praise God. Did you get that? Not, oh, I, no, you have a responsibility to praise God. This was a commandment from the throne of God that says, if you have breath, praise me. Because if you don't, the rocks and stones are going to cry out. <clears throat> so there comes a point in this process where we have to get beyond ourselves, beyond our intimidation, beyond the things, and just begin to praise and worship God. And I'm watching to see what's going on because, you know, to hear the word is one thing, to do the word's another, right? Right? God admonishes us on that and says, don't just be a hearer. So here's what I'm waiting to see, Pastor Frank. We talked about this week one. When we come into the house of God and we begin to worship, and Etik is doing that opening prayer and we're in the process of prayer, our response to that should be what? Yada. Our response to that should be, God, here I am. That should be our first response to that. But here's what we do. Hurry up and play something. You know, let's get this going. Or, man, if I had just another cup of coffee, this would be so good. You know, if, 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 if this wasn't going on, if that wasn't going on, if I wasn't doing it, what, oh, my goodness, the, the, the Steelers play today, or, or if you're really a backslider, the Patriots play today. <clears throat> and, and we've got to get there for that. And then, you know, uh, Aunt Pookie's birthday and, and I got all these other things going on. And then all of a sudden, oh yeah, we're singing. Here I am to worship. And we've not come to the presence of God and said, God, I'm here. My focus, we sang this last week. I focus my eyes on you. I look towards the heavens because where you focus is where you go. 
So if I, if I need my mind to go towards praise and I need my mind to go towards worship, that's where I need to focus. I need to put these other things aside. We open up for pre-prayer service at 10 o'clock. The purpose of that pre-prayer service is not for anything other than to focus. Head for a table over in a fellowship hall and focus. Pray for your pastor. Pray for the service. Pray for the worship team. Lord, pray for yourself. And get myself focused. But here's what happens. <clears throat> and I understand life. I do. Church starts at 1030. At 1037, I'm pulling in the parking lot. And we're going to run in there and we're going to get something today. We need to prepare ourselves. This isn't just something we do. And yeah, I'm going from preaching to meddling, but it'll be okay. You guys can still love me. I'm not going to stop the service and make an announcement because you walked in late. I'm not going to do that to you. God would be stopping a lot. No. I'm just, we need to raise our level of respect for our God. What would happen, Steve, if you went into work every day 10 minutes late? No. Well, for you, nothing. Okay. Let me find somebody else that, that it would make it. For most of us, if we go into work and show up 10 minutes late every day, we're going to get fired. There's going to be a reprimand. There's going to be something there. There's a consequence. We're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Why can't we show up on time? It's 1030. Get out of bed. Get moving. 1030, I'm already on my second pot of coffee. You know? Oh, but this is my only day to sleep in. Which is more important to us? Where's our priority level? Is the presence of God more important or is sleep? Now, listen, there's been times in my life that I'd answered the question sleep. Because you don't understand, I'm wore out. I need my rest. I need, but there is nothing better than the presence of God to refresh your soul. There's nothing better. And when we begin to put the zamar of worship into place, where we begin to sing. See, when I'm facing situations in my life, DJ, I'm a musician, so what do I do? I grab a guitar, I grab my saxophone, and, and I go by myself. And I hide somewhere. And I just begin to play. Especially with my horns. On the family farm, we have one spot that I just love. It's a bowl. And there's a big tree that has fallen there. And it's a good seat. I can set good. And I'll take my soprano saxophone. And I'll walk up on the hill. And I'll go back to this bowl. And the acoustics are perfect. Perfect. And I'll begin to play. And I've, I've heard God's voice more clearly there than anywhere else that I've ever been. It's my place. And when I lose focus, that's where I go. If I can't get there, I go right here. to an altar and I bow before God which is part of my praise and I just begin to express to him how great he is I begin to express to him my dependence upon him because if it wasn't for God I would have nothing all good things come from where Hmm. 
J.C. Penney's. No, all good things come from God. He is my Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me. So doesn't it stand to reason if somebody is blessing you that much, doesn't it stand to reason you want to say thank you? So let's start saying thank you. Let's get to that process that we become, instead of being spoiled children, we become grateful adults. Now that one didn't go very far. Let me go back and go to that again. Instead of being a spoiled brat to say, nah, 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 give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, we become a responsible, grateful adult that says, thank you for what you've given to me. I now have the desire that I want to bless you back. I want to do what you've asked me to do. Why? Because you're great. That's all. Just because you're great. And he loves to bless you. He loves to spend time with you. He enjoys that whole process. So much so that you begin to break into song. Can't help it. And listen, if you couldn't carry a tune, if you strapped it to you and handcuffed it and put it in a bucket, it's okay. God covered you. He said, make a joyful noise. He didn't say you have to be the greatest singer on the planet, but he did say make a noise. And this is foreign ground for some people. What's the one comedian uh, that, that talked about going to the, the African-American church and all of a sudden people started talking back to the preacher and he's like, shh, that's disrespectful. Don't do, don't. And, and some people were raised in that, that thing that says you never talk, you never say anything, you're reverent. And believe me, there is a place for reverence. There is. But there's nothing reverent about praise. Matter of fact, we'll get here in a minute, maybe not today. We'll get to the point where it says praise is hilarious. David danced before the Lord with all of his might, so much so that his wife Michael looked out the window and says, you're ridiculous. And God closed her womb and made her barren because she criticized praise. That's how seriously God takes praise. It's okay to be that's why when the little ones are dancing up here, I'm not going, sit down, you behave yourself. Now, if they're running in circles and being stupid, that's another thing. But you can tell when they, when, listen, maybe somebody ought to come up here and join with them. We, really? To where you might be a little bit foolish. But if it's praise to draw attention to God, it's in order. If it's to draw attention to you, it's out of order. And trust me, if I'm going to dance, it ain't for you. When I lift my arms, when I begin to praise, it's not for your benefit. I'm not doing it so you can say, did you see him? He had his hands up, he's worshiping God, he's it's not for you. It's for my God. When we come up here and sing and we begin the Zamar, it's not for your entertainment. If you enjoy it, great. That's not why we do it. It is done for the glory of God. If it gets to the point, Robert, that we do it for you, we're out of order and we're wrong. That means our focus is wrong. If we're there to put on a show, God's going to deal harshly with us because then we're touching his glory. 
We spend time practicing. We spend time learning new songs, not near as much as we should. For what purpose? Do you realize that service, this, this hour and a half or so that we spend together, doesn't just happen? You know, the, the, the worship team just doesn't come in and all of a sudden, boop, we're just going to... No. There is some preparation that goes into it. We'll get together and we'll spend time learning songs. We'll spend time practicing. We'll spend time trying to figure out how to follow etiquette. Uh, <laughs> you know, to know where she's going and how she's going and, and how do you repeat and when do you repeat? And how many times are we going to sing it? And you'll see her do things like she'll put the two fingers out and everybody's like, what in the world is she doing? Peace? No. It's telling us we're going to the verse. Let's go back and do it. If she holds up number one, that means we're going to the chorus. We're going we're to play that one again. Or she'll do this number. She's not saying whoopee. No. She's telling us we're going to. All of this happens in practice, which is preparation for praise. Now, I've, I've been doing this a long time. I, I started, I preached my first sermon in Laura when I was 12 years old. I've been preaching a long time. I still have to prepare to get ready to stand here on Sunday mornings because I don't want to give you something that God's not saying. So I have to prepare. I have to put myself in prayer. I have to put myself in the word and I've got to put myself in praise. But you know what? It's still not for you. That preparation, that time is to glorify my God. Now, my job is to help you and challenge you to get closer to God. To get that process moving inside of your spirit so that you do what? Prayer, prepare, and praise. For when? For right now. That when you get ready to come in here on Sunday, the word of God, DJ, says something funny. When you gather together, everybody brings something. Is that what, what it says? Some have a song. Some have a testimony. Some have a... Why? Because we're prepared. So when, when you come in, what part of the worship did you bring with you? I brought the dysfunctional part. I brought the... No, it, it's what I've prepared. You know, when you've been invited to someone's home and it's going to be a potluck, in other words, you've got to bring a dish. I, I've seen, you'll go on and you'll go on to cooks.com. You'll start looking for new recipes. You'll start, because you want to be the dish on the table. That everybody goes, ooh, that's good. Nobody wants to be the bag of chips. You know, okay, some of you might want to be, but we'll work and we do and, and, and we want everybody to say, boy, that was good. We're setting a buffet, if you will, here of our praise to God. I want God to say, boy, that was good. I think I want seconds. You can always tell whose dish is the best because it's empty. And those that we tolerate because there's a scoop out of it and that was because the pastor was being polite. <laughs> or I said, Pastor Frank said, you, you, you do. I, no, no. Or back in the old days, though, some of you will say your age, we'll send Mikey. Mikey will eat anything. <laughs> he likes it. But we prepare. We're coming to the house of God to present ourselves a living sacrifice. A little preparation goes a long ways. If you'll just take a little bit of time to prepare yourself. Even when we go to the communion table, the Lord says what? Examine yourself. To see if there be anything in you. I can remember growing up, Pastor Frank, I was scared to walk into church if I hadn't spent at least 10 minutes repenting. 
because I was around prophetic people growing up. And I was, especially one lady in particular, Pastor Rita's mother. Her name was Teresa. Teresa Robinson. I literally, when she got sick and I would visit her at home, I'm a grown adult. I would literally stand on the porch and say, Father God, forgive me. Anything that's hidden in my heart that I don't see, please forgive me. Because I was getting ready to walk in to Teresa's living room. And she was scary. She could read your laundry, man. I mean, she just, you'd walk in and you didn't even have to say who was there. She, she began to prophesy. And this woman was accurate. When you're getting ready to step into the presence of God, at least take five minutes to repent. <laughs> To say, Father God, forgive me for the places that I've fallen short. For the things that I've done that have not been pleasing to you. Because Lord, I want my sacrifice to be pure and holy. I don't want to give you my second best. I want to give you my best. I, listen, I'm not looking for perfection. I'm just looking for your best. So God, forgive me. Stop at the door before you reach for the doorknob. And at that point, at least give yourself a few moments to say, God, forgive me for wanting to kill my kids. <laughs> forgive me for the thoughts that I've had. Forgive me for that person that cut me off in traffic and I told them, I'll stop there and leave that for interpretation. Does it make sense? Because when we go into this presence, it shouldn't take us 30 minutes to get our mind focused. Now all of a sudden praise and worship's over and the pastor's getting up to preach and now it's over with. What just happened? We used to sing a song, Dan Dawn, that says, do not pass me by. What was the title of the song. Jesus, don't pass me by. And I wonder how many times I've missed the, the presence of God because I'm so busy that he walked right past. He, he went right past me. And because of my focus, because of my thing, it was... Remember when we went to Pastor Larry's church, he preached a sermon on Zacchaeus. That first night we went to the church. And this sermon on Zacchaeus, he talked about Zacchaeus was, we know the, from being a child in Sunday school, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. <sighs> okay, so here's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a scoundrel. He was a tax collector that robbed from people. So he skimmed. He went and collected two and he kept one. Okay, that was Zacchaeus. You can look it up and read it for yourself if you want to, if you don't believe me. Okay? But Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was going to pass by his town, his city. But Zacchaeus was vertically challenged. He was short. So he couldn't see over the crowd. So he found a tree because he was going to do whatever it took to just get a glimpse of God. Now, here's a man that was not worthy to even speak the name of Jesus, but he wanted to see him. And he began to praise by his actions. I will do what it takes to at least see your face. So he climbs up in a tree to get a sight, to see something. And he caught Jesus' attention, and Jesus said, you, come here. Let's go to your house. Now, imagine the walk that, that, that Zacchaeus is having home. Good Lord, what's on the coffee table? What's in the refrigerator? Did I clean up? Uh, did, uh, 
And the word that Pastor Larry preached was God's getting ready to do a quick work in you. Because that day, Zacchaeus and his family got saved. So much so that Zacchaeus went and made everything right. Everything that he had stolen. Every person that he had taken advantage of. Praise and worship and being exposed to the presence of God will make you fix what's wrong. So, the question comes down to, am I really serious about this thing we call being a Christian? Or am I just playing? Thank you, Jesus, for the music from heaven. Oh, never mind. That was the basement. They're okay. Doesn't bother me. That process, am I really serious about this thing? If I am, then I'll be willing to put the work in necessary to be able to go into the presence of God. There are things it requires of me. How many of you have ever saw, I'm going to backslide here a minute, The Last Samurai? Seen the movie? Oh, come on. You guys don't be that spiritual. I know you guys have seen that movie. <laughs> he was taught how to come into the emperor's presence. And he had to practice it. Don't look him in the eye. Crawl, stay low, do all these things. And when you present your sword, do it humbly. He practiced coming into the presence. And this guy's just an emperor. We're coming into the presence of God. So let's practice. How do we come into the presence of God? Well, we've covered the first five ways so far. The difference is instead of having to uh, never look him in the face, God wants us to look him in the face. To speak to him, to declare his word, to declare his goodness, to declare his righteousness. So much so that we can't keep it inside, we got to let it out. How do we let it out? We let it out with a shout. It's what the word of God says. Shouting in that process brings something out that changes your atmosphere. How did the children of Israel beat Jericho? They shouted. That didn't make any sense. If you study Jericho, it was the largest fortified city in Canaan. So much so that on the walls you could ride chariots, was it three abreast? If I remember correctly. All right, so three chariots side by side could ride on the top of the wall. And here's little old Israel with sticks. And we're going to beat you. It's like that little yapping dog. Oh, get away. And God says, be obedient. Shh. Just walk. Seven days. Walk. On the seventh day, seven times. On the seventh time, we're going to blow the trumpets and we're going to shout. Now, how ludicrous is that? I'm going to scream at the wall. But something happened. When they began to shout and they began to glorify God, it got his attention. The great amplifier of his spirit kicks in. The walls begin to vibrate and disintegrated. From what? From the sound of praise. How many of us have something in our life that needs to disintegrate? We've fought it. We've kicked it. We've beat it. We've done all these things. Maybe it's time you shout at it. What shout? The shout of praise. Sing to it. You know how they always said music can calm the savage beast? When you're wanting to set that atmosphere, you do it with music. I talked to you last week. If you're at a fast food restaurant, they turn the lights real bright. 
and they put on fast music because they want you in and out. Fine dining, they turn the lights down, they put on nice soft music because they want you to relax. Sometimes I think God thinks we're at the fast food restaurant and we're not even good enough to get out and come in. We're going to go through the drive through and order off the board. God, I need blessing number four and please supersize that. And God said, come to me and spend some time. I've prepared something for you. But all it really takes, Steve, is for us to have a little bit of obedience. Maybe we have to look a little foolish. So what is it in this process? So the challenge comes down to, as we start going through this thing of worship and this thing of praise, begin to put these things into practice. And, and it may feel, make you feel uncomfortable to start with. And you, you might be, uh, I don't remember how the comedian talked about the, the raising of the hands in different churches. You know, if you haven't seen it, you ought to look that one up. It's really funny. And, and you might be the starting off. But you know what? It's okay. You might be the starting off. It's okay. But eventually, when the desperation of you gets big enough, you're going to be going, and you know what? It's okay. And the first time you sing, you might not be able to, you might just be like, Jesus. It's a start. I've just got to begin to get this thing out of me a little bit. And before long, you're going to be singing in there. You'll be like, Whoo, thank you, Jesus. I love you. I praise you. I adore you. It isn't on key, but it's a joyful noise. And we're good. Because you now have God's attention. He says, I want to be there. That is one heck of a party. But it's going to begin with you. It's going to begin with your process. Because I promise you something. I will praise the Lord. I promise you. My God in my life is too good for me not to. When I don't get the opportunity to praise God, I feel like I'm going to explode. I'm going to let it out. You're going to hear me playing my horn. You're going to hear me singing. Uh, and there may be times you even see me dance. You do, you know God's real close. What's your expression? What's your expression? The one choice you don't have is to be silent. Because there's nothing in praise that's quiet. Now, is there a spiritual discipline of silence? Yeah. There are times where God says, be still and know that I am God. But that's when you're trying to do things yourself. That's not during worship. That's not during praise. We're only talking about one aspect of this process. I hear a sound. I hear a sound. And I've been looking for this sound for a long time. A long time. And I've talked to my kids about it. I've talked to my wife about it. I've talked to different people about it. There's a sound from the platform that I hear. That instrumentation is not there yet. So I'm looking all the time. I'm looking for those musicians that are going to fill out that sound. I've got that, that burning of King David in me that says, God, I hear a sound. I need that sound. But there's also a sound I hear from here that I don't hear yet. Because there's many times that as we're worshiping and praising, we hear crickets. It feels like we're there by ourselves. That sound is a sound of people worshiping God. Responding to God. 
And I'm not talking about being super. I'm talking about you expressing your love for God. One of the most difficult times is when etiquette goes into the song of the Lord, everybody goes, what in the world is that? So what we're going to do is I'm going to take some Wednesday nights and we're going to practice worship. Maybe we'll do that the next two. We're just going to practice worship. And I'm going to sit with the guitar and we're just going to practice worship. I'm going to give you the opportunity to open your mouth in a less intimidating format. Because sometimes this can be intimidating. But we're just going to sit and I'm going to sit down here and we're just going to talk about and practice worship. And I want to take each one of these words, Robert, and I want to experience each word. So we'll, we'll experience and do by demonstration and then by participation what it means. Now, some are going to be completely scared off and not even show up for this. But I promise you this will be life-changing for you. I promise you it will be life-changing. Because the first time you experience it, whew. so it's going to require you some effort. It's going to require you to maybe leave work and, and go get dinner quickly and be here by 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. I'm going to keep you from 7 to 8. We hold it at an hour, right? We hold it at an hour. Now, we may go and start working on the Zamar and God may show up and we may be here three hours. But you're free to get up and go whenever you want to. Okay? But let's begin to invest in our praise. Okay? And for the next couple of Wednesday nights, we're just going to practice these. All right? And we've got two more words to cover that we'll cover next week. And everybody's waiting for me to get to the halal, where it's where we get hallelujah. Now, it's coming. It's almost there. All right? And, and we're going to talk about those and what it actually means to be hilarious in the presence of God. When we see fans, or we get that, where we get that word fanatic, that's what we're talking about. You should not root for the mountaineers any louder than you praise your God. Ouch. And I've heard some of you. I've been at the ball games. I've been at different places. And our worship to God should be greater than anything else we worship. If you have this, this person that you really love, this band, I, I can't even think of. Who's your favorite band? Somebody, some music. It doesn't have to be Christian, anybody. Casting Crowns. Crown. All right, Casting Crowns is going to be in Pittsburgh. All right? We will get tickets, pay too much for them, fight traffic, stand in line, go sit on seats that we, they look at this tall, being that far away, and we will be idiots. Woo! And just go to town. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drive home, wore out, get up and go to work the next day. Mm, hallelujah. I'm asking you to invest in your praise. To invest in your praise. It will be better than any concert you can go to. Because God's presence is greater than anything you can experience. So let's experience it. Let's go together. Let's take these seven words that we're learning and let's put them into action. There'll be no video on, so I'm not going to have any video evidence of you to send it into CNN. It's good, okay? It's safe. It's going to be okay. And see, when this begins to happen, we begin to see signs and wonders. Healings take place. 
Prophecies take place. Deliverance takes place. All of these things start happening. Why do they start happening? Because where the presence of God is, there's liberty. When liberty takes place, chains fall off. I tell you what, if this doesn't get your pimpler moving, your pimpler's broke. You know, this is one of those things that says, hey, God, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go because, listen, it's about glorifying God. This is what this thing's about. And so many times, we're just not good at it. Why are we not good at it? Because we never practiced. Throw you in the ball game and say, go play. And you don't even know what position you're supposed to play. I tell you to play the mic backer, and everybody's like, the mic backer? What in the world's mic? Hitting that the drummer? No. And I tell you to fill the number five hole, and you're going, what? Why? Because you've never practiced. You don't know. But once we practice, now I put you in. Once, I, once you practice, we get you into that process, and now you become good at it. You become good at it. And then you get to teach someone else. And then before long, you know what happens here on Sundays when we come together? There's a sound that's produced. And the anticipation of the presence of God wells up inside of you that you won't be late because you can't wait for the presence of God. And it's just like, oh man, what's God going to do today? My level of expectation comes up. I come in expecting something. I come in expecting a change. I come in expecting the presence of God. I come expecting my healing. I come in expecting my deliverance. I come in expecting my word because I will be in the presence of God because I'm glorifying my God. Father God, I love you. I thank you so much for your word and for your presence, Father. Lord, it's with great anticipation that I look forward to the future. Lord, experiencing and practicing what it means to praise you and what it means to worship you. Lord, I pray that you're pleased today with our attitudes, our actions, and our words. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.